Good afternoon. Hi, everyone. How do you do? Hi, good afternoon. Ms. Thomas, how are you doing? Hi, good afternoon. Um, I also... It seems that um, a number of the colleagues are here for our session. Let me start by welcoming you all to this uh, important training engagement. Special welcome to our trainer, Dr. Chantal Moore from the School of Education, who will take us through this particular session. Of course, um, she has been involved in preparing the persons in the School of Education to use the new technology based on the new requirements of the present period. Of course, the, we want to ensure in the HRD unit that we are on board and we are engaging the required technology and to make sure that um, we do that, I think that the training is necessary. And so let me say that this may be the first of a number of training session, sessions that we will go through, but um, we hope to gather as much as possible from um, this first session. Some persons are acquainted with the technology. I see where um, OUR Bailey and uh, PBC. And uh, of course, uh, Zoom is already there. So at least there's one of the technologies that, we, that most persons would be acquainted with. So our focus will be on those two. And so we'll have more tools at our disposal and uh, um, hopefully we'll be able to engage our students with much enthusiasm and um, rigor because we, despite the situation now, we have to um, continue um, the program and we have to conclude this um, present training with this current group. Also, we are looking forward to next semester and um, there's no guarantee about face-to-face. -face. So we have asked those persons who will teach next semester to be here with us. So those are my initial comments. And um, I know that um, Ms. Thomas may have one to other areas to, to highlight. Olivine? Well, I just wanted to thank Dr. Moore for her generosity in coming forward to help us in the HRD unit to get on board. She is extremely well qualified to be sharing her knowledge with us today. She's a person who has run this um, for several years over in the School of Education, and she was the person who was helping us before now to try to get our courses online. So we've had a long association with Dr. Moore, and she's been very generous in helping us before and now. And um, she will be doing two sessions for us, this one for the lecturers and one on Sunday for the students. So I would like to thank her personally. And of course, at some point when, when um, place is open again, I'll be sending her flowers. <laughs> All right. All right. Any other general comments from colleagues? I would, I would also like to tell people, even though we're recording this, please try to make your own notes. It helps, it helps me when I'm doing my notes, and um, I'm sure it will help you. Step one, step two, step three, step four. We can't go wrong if we're doing it that way. All right? Okay. okay. Let uh, any, anyone else want to, before we ask Dr. Moore to take us through, All right, Dr. Moore.
Hi, colleagues. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hope that you're all well. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hi, it's a pleasure to work with colleagues across the campus because sometimes we stay in our little spaces and we don't get a chance to interact. So I'm really happy for this. And I know that each of you, you're at different stages in terms of your competence and your abilities and the kinds of work that you have been doing in online teaching, particularly using the Orville Learning Management System. So today we are hoping not to spend too long a time here because I know some of you have dinners to eat or to cook <laughs> and so many other things, right? So we're going to get to it. And um, if you have questions at the end, any specific things that you want me to address, I will be more than happy to do so. All right. So all of us, we have been thrown into teaching online willingly are screaming and kicking, but we have to make it happen, all right? All right, so one of the obvious things with technology is that sometimes it misbehaves. It doesn't really know how to, you know, just perform in the right way and at the right time when we want it. Sometimes it does, maybe one out of 10 times, but the other nine out of 10, you have to be patient with it and be willing to lose a few hours sometimes or minutes, it depends, okay? So you should be seeing my screen about um, strengthening capacity of faculty, and that should not be in the School of Education. It's really about, um, with you now, um, here in the Faculty of Social Sciences in the HRMD program. And I am actually, this is actually a presentation that I worked along, I shared with faculty in, um, Come on. I shared with faculty in School of Education and I'm now sharing it with you today. All right, so we want to look at the areas we're going to cover this afternoon. It's really three things that I want us to achieve here today and anything else that you deem important that you need, all right? So we want to be able to look at our course outline. I think that's a good place to start from and to make sure it's user-friendly and appealing to students in the online environment. The second thing is to look at the learning management system, Moodle, and we have named our Moodle learning management system, or VLE. So how do we maximize the tools there for students' engagement? Then I want to point you to open educational resources, which are available offering a wide repertoire of resources that you can access to share with students and particularly because students cannot move about as freely to go to libraries or to access maybe even databases in um, offered by the UMona library. So let's find resources and bring to the space for our students. And finally, we're gonna have a little bit of talk about how we can sustain our students' interest throughout our online course as we continue to teach them for the rest of the semester. All right, so that's where we're going. I just need to find out from you colleagues, is it that you are, you know, you've always been teaching it face-to-face -face and you're now moving online because of COVID or what exactly? I just need a little bit of context to guide me so I'm not saying the wrong things. Mainly face-to-face. I mean, the face to face. All right. And, um, and so you're now going into COVID to finish up the rest of the semester with the students and possibly into the next academic year, as Dr. Profferton said. Yes, that's it. Yeah. All right. Sounds good. Thank you very much. And um, please feel free to raise your hand at any point. Stop me. It, it's, I'm fine with that. All right. Uh huh. Okay. So let's look at it. I, I think. A good place to be since because because you've been teaching face to face mostly many of you would not have prepared your courses for online delivery and so the place to begin is to look back at your course outlines when you look at your course outlines you might be teaching them in a very um, segmented way in the face to face classroom meaning you don't necessarily teach it to give students a link to what came before. There might not be bridges where you sequentially build on content. It could be that you're just teaching disparate content 
to the students. So you'll say, this week we're doing this. And then next week, when, when it comes, you move on to another topic. But students don't necessarily see the link back to last week's topic or it doesn't necessarily build on. But really, all of our courses, there is a thread connecting the units and how it is taught in the face-to-face. -face. The thread might not be seamless, but in the online space, we will need to ensure that we try to have that seamless flow. So we need to look back at our course outlines and look to see what are the remaining units we have this semester to cover and try to organize this semester or the units in the semester for maximum flow. And from there, once you have that flow, then we can begin to look at the ORVLE resources and the activities that are there to bring out the content that students need to grasp. And the activities will certainly help students to apply knowledge of the content, all right? And um, so we'll need to, in creating our courses, we'll need to storyboard them for the rest of the semester so that we can have a smoother transition from face-to-face -to, -face to the virtual learning environment or the container. So when we're finished here today, I would encourage you to find a colleague or two with whom you can you know, just shoot the wind. You can bounce ideas off each other. When you've worked in your space, get the feedback from your colleague about how it looks, what else could be done? Is it impactful enough? Is it doing what it is supposed to do? So I would propose that as a homework for you going forward, all right? So let's understand what I mean by storyboarding your course units. Um, the storyboard is mostly a visual outline where you're conveying images to your, your students. And if you think about a comic book, a comic book is very much like a storyboard where you see visually a, a picture frame one after the other leading up and you get the story by the time you come to the end of um, reading the comic. And it is the same that it should be in your online courses because you want students to take away the main ideas, the important scenes or content from your courses. And so we need to storyboard it in a visual and effective way. So then, this is my course outline and you know, I would go through it, but um, I'm gonna not focus so much on the course outline today. I, um, I, I won't focus on the course outline today. I was thinking because I have my course outline in the back to show you the kinds of you know, crossing out and changes I'm making, but I'm sure you would know the, that process when you go to your own course outlines again. So now imagine that you have done the crossing out, you have arranged your course unit, units in the best order you think to get students to conceptualize the remaining story within the course. It's now time for you to think about how you're going to move that story from your course outline into Orvieli for students to get it. So Orvieli really operates on two principles, ladies and, and gentlemen, colleagues. Um, it operates on the principles of um, activities and it also operates on the principle of um, resources. So there are two things there, the resources and you have the activities. I want to suggest that our courses should be first and foremost research so resource driven because it's the resource part that is going to give students the content that they need the information that they need to process and work with so in Orville, you're able to deliver that content the information the resources to students using these resources here on the on Orville, a book a file a folder um, the content package label, page, URL, and it goes on. And then once you have presented students with the resources, then you can now integrate or incorporate activities into RVLE to get students to show you or to show themselves or to show colleagues or their peers that they have grasped the, the knowledge. They, so from the resources, you put in activities to get students to demonstrate that they have grasped 
the activities, they have met the unit objectives. And some of the activities that are available in Orville are the assignment, the chat, choice, database, external tool, feedback, and the list goes on. So what I'm going to be doing now, I'm going to pull away from this PowerPoint, and I'm actually going to go into one of my courses on Orville and look to see and, and work with a real space to show you how we can, can do this thing a little bit better, all right? So you should be seeing here one of the courses in the School of Education, which is Introduction to Qualitative Research in Education. So what we are doing in the School of Education, not all of our courses were online. The majority of our courses were taught face-to-face, -face, some blended. And we actually have an online section that has been going for a number of years in, you know, in that direction. So now that we are forced to go all online, we are thinking that it's important for us to brand our courses, to work with a consistent framework for our courses. So if you think about like um, a developmental complex, a development complex, and um, or even say, yeah, yeah like a an, where you know NHT they, they build these housing complexes and they tend to make the outside of it consistently the same. So it's the same roof, it's the same color painting on the on the, the walls outside, it's the same design outside. And they tell you that you cannot change outside because that is what brands the place. This is what makes this um complex what it is. But when you go inside the rooms or the houses or the different apartments, you're going to find individuality. You're going to find that everybody does it differently. And that's great. But when you go outside, it's a consistent frame. So that's what we're doing in the School of Education. We're working, moving towards a consistent frame to brand our courses. And there's a plus for that because when students get into the course spaces, irrespective of whether they're doing two, three, or five courses. They don't have to be floundering around and trying to figure out how things should look within the course space. They go in, they, they, from the outside, they know what it is, they know the template. And so right now, all they're taking time to do is to engage with the materials, not to do the treasure hunt and the lost and found and the search and all of that, no. So what you're seeing here is just our brand. We start with a banner and a little quote and we have our photograph each lecturer has his or her photograph and the lecturer's name there in the school of education and we have our little logo then we have our, the course lecturer's introduction and particularly no you will need to have your introductions because students are just coming into the space many of them are not used to the online space and many things are happening in their lives with regard to COVID-19. So we need to, you know, bring them in. So this introduction that you're seeing here really is for one that this course started at, this course was online from the start of the semester, all right? So this is not an introduction welcoming them after COVID. So your introduction might be different here, but what is important, you have to think about how students come into your space and what they see. Do they feel welcome? Do they feel um, a sense of balance and harmony within the space? Do they get relevant information and those kinds of things? So in this introductory space, I'm telling the students my name, I'm telling them you know, what I'm expecting. I'm telling them my consultation times. And I'm also pointing out to them the days when I'll be available on the system for consultation because we're not going to be on every single day, every hour night. The students nor the lecturer has that kind of time. So irrespective of the tool that you use to consult with your students, you need to let them know when you will be there or when you'll be checking to give feedback on comments or questions they might pose, right? And then I wrap up my welcome by signaling when we will be having our live sessions or synchronous sessions. Because our students are used to face-to-face, -to, -face, to just drop them straight into an, a, an online 
classroom where they never engage as we're doing now would be a kind of steep thing, you know? It's, it's gonna be hard for them to adapt that quickly. Some will, but um, I think it's something to think about in terms of whether or not you wouldn't want to have some Zoom sessions or Blackboard Collaborate sessions with your students, if not for three hours, at least for an hour um, during the time that you would normally meet them. So your class might be on a Friday from 4 to 7 p.m. You might not want to have them meeting you all that time, but you might want to say um, every Friday going forward while we're in this semester, I'd like everybody to log in between the hours of um, six and seven or four and five, you know, so I want you to spend time exploring the unit throughout the week. But when Friday comes for that one hour, I want to meet with you on Blackboard Collaborate so that we can engage and discuss. And that's something that you should seriously think about building into your course um, for, the, for this semester because your students are used to face-to-face -face and to ask them to just cut off cold turkey and go into a purely asynchronous environment will be a little bit hard to swallow for many of your students. So, I did it because I want students to know when, you know, I, I did this thing. And then another thing within our frame now, and this is, many of you would probably have some of these things. I'm not saying anything new, but for those of you who have not considered it, you might want to make this part of your course as you are configuring it and storyboarding it. So you have your new space where you know students can check for news once a student is registered to your course um, and you post a message in the news then they automatically get it in their email as well your course outline should be there um, some persons would want to make their course outline a pdf document rather than a word document the pdf document um, is beneficial in that your material is not out of whack when students open it on any device so irrespective of the device, when they open a PDF document, they see it as you uploaded it. And, and that is important. However, if, it's, uh, if your course outline has information on it that you want students to copy and paste into something else or to manipulate, then don't use a PDF document. Keep it at Word so that students are, easy, are able to manipulate the document. So, those are some of the things we need to think about as we design course spaces to make life a lot easier for our students. Then we, I, we do the welcome. And um, after that, we ha have all the course assignments noted. You don't have to put your assignments up front. You can put them in the units that the data, the data units are, I'm not saying that right. You might want to put them in the unit for when um, the, the assignment is actually due, the date by which that particular assignment is due. All right, so hope I got that right. I'm just saying you don't have to put them all here. You can put them down below in your regular units at the time when they become due. I think I got it right now. Okay, so um, beyond that, we the consultation space is there and so on. Well, all right, and um, because in this course, we also use Zoom. We have the Zoom links and the time and dates when students will click on the link to access class, all right? So then here are my units. And for the units, I, I think it's important for us to put dates on the units, right? So that students can know when a unit starts and when a unit ends. And they would know that they're supposed to prepare for the next one. Some other little interesting things that you can do here, you could actually put the time, how long it will take to complete a unit. So you could say to students, it will take you four hours to com complete this entire unit so that students can plan and know how they're going to break up their time. That's something that you can consider. Um, sorry, um, Olivine, was this session supposed to be recorded? Uh, yes, I'm recording it. Okay, wonderful. <laughs> Sorry. Uh <-huh. laughs> okay, great. And um, right, so you you but at the start of a unit, I I want to show you now we're into the section now where we're looking at the Orville tools, and by the tools I'm talking about the resources as well as the activities. 
what you see before you, it's a combination of um, resources that that makes this unit looks like this. So the combination includes what right here, what you're looking at is all of that. I use a label to bring that information out. So the label actually allows you to do, to, to incorporate text and other kinds of media into the space. It's also wonderful for breaking up the monotony of a space. It is also excellent for um, when you want to add color and variety, you can do that. A, a label feature helps with that, right? And the label functions as a resource. It's about giving information, all right? And then you have here the learning outcomes. This is on a page and, and I use a page to note the learning outcomes. Here's another label where I am just listing now what is gonna come after. And then I have all of these as files. I use the file feature to deliver information to the students. These are readings as PDF documents. And then this one is an external link, a video link. So students can see that. And then here we have the forum where we're allowing students to have an in, um, share ideas for engagement among themselves. And then I end the unit with students' questions on the unit because as students are going through, they might have questions and I won't be there because as is, it's an, it's an asynchronous space right here throughout the week. And um, students might go on on February 10 another student probably will go on on February 11 or another on February 13, and they'll go on at different hours. A student's best learning time might be three o'clock in the morning. Another one might be two o'clock in the evening. So they have that flexibility. And as they're going through, they're, they might have questions when you're not there. So it's really good to create that space for them to post the questions on that, that pertain to that unit, or you can, um, you know, that you, they can post it in the consultation space. But I keep both because the consultation space is ready to deal with global issues. Whereas the unit space where you post your questions deals specifically with that unit. So, you know, it, it allows me to manage the space better and it also allows me to maximize my time, you know, and, and be direct in terms of where I'm going and where I give feedback to students. So this is just one unit here. And then here you have a second unit. And so this is what I mean by the template being consistent. So you have your framing um, time period, or you might, you might not want to use dates. You might want to just call it unit one, or you, you have different ways within which you can do it. You can do it as topics, dates, and a combination. And you can vary how you choose to. Right, um, and then you we have our the, the label and the label. What I want to say to you why why I value the label at the start of each unit is a way to pull students in. It's a way to connect to what was discussed before in a previous unit and how to move forward in this unit. It also makes me appear personable to the students. I also give students a sense of presence. You know that. Um, I, the, the lecturer's presence is here and the lecturer is also inviting them in as well to share their presence, right? So you think about the language, you think about how you want them to, to see you and to respond to you. So for me, it's more about conversation in my course spaces and not so much like top down. So how you use language would also give you a sense, will also give your, your learners or students a sense of the power relationships within your course, as well as how you value, you know, them and how you treat them, whether as adults or, you know, it, it, it's a whole lot of things people can read from your language. So you have to think of that persona, that online persona that you're going to bring, and you feel comfortable with that persona, and you go ahead and, and work it. Um, only to say that, um, you know, we're working with adults throughout and we just need to always, you know, keep that sense of respect going between 
the lecturer and the students. I find that works better with adult learners, all right? And so the same kind of pattern continues and, and it's there again and, and it goes on. So after a while, what you're gonna find is that you, that you have a system that works for you, the students understand that system and they're working along with it. But more than ever, all the hard work goes in now. And so the next time that you're offering this course and you're teaching the course, it's less construction for you. You have done the major construction. It's more now about, you know, just a little bit of modification, tweaking here, there, and everywhere as you see fit. And um, the labor is intensive at the start, but it gets better when you have other offers of it. So I want to now show you how do we create some of those if, if it is that you are not sure. Do I, I'd like to pause here to ask if there's any questions so far before we move on to actually engage in the, um, the construction of the resources. How do you use, um, construct them? Any questions or concerns? I, I just wanted to know how you did the picture and the, the banner and all of that at the front. All right. It seem very small, but yes, I believe in the branding of the program. Sure. Well, we have um, we we got a, a graphic designer to do it for us. So every lecturer forwarded their photograph, and then we, you know, sent that to the graphic designer, and we talked with the graphic designer about what exactly we want on the banner, and that's how it is. So, and then when we got it. We just gave it to each lecturer to upload in his or her course, or one of us, we could do it for the lecturer, if the lecturer has a challenge or so. So we could talk about it if you want, Olivine, it's up to you afterwards. All right, but we thought we needed it to be professionally done because, you know, it's a one-time thing and it, it really goes a long way, all right? Any all right, one other thing, one other thing, well, okay, let other people talk. All right, nobody wants to talk? All right, one of the things so um, that we have thought... So I'm good. Okay, hi, Rowan. We're good. Hi, Doc. We're good. All right, one of the things um, we have done is to put up like a classroom library and That's put great. in teaching aids uh, for the students. Uh, mm -hmm. Your thing would be like you've broken down your classroom library to each section, but what we've done with ours is to have a general reading library and then specific readings for each module. But um, the, the general thing was also to add in this thing about reading beyond the PowerPoints and reading beyond what the lecturer said to get some more stuff. So that was one idea I'd put on the table and we put in other teaching aids as well, you know? That's, so That's excellent. Yeah. And um, you, you will come up with your own ways of doing stuff and that's fine. As I said, the interior of the house is for you to decorate as you wish, whichever furniture, whatever style. As long as you know that you have a bed to sleep on, you have the kitchen, you know, you have some basic things that are essential. So the library is good because, and particularly in COVID time, students need materials to read. Um, the only thing I would want to say about the library is that um, they, you'd have to, it's in the folders that you, it's a folder that you use, right, Olivine? No, it's, it's at the top um, under oh, the course outline. There are past papers and this, so it's just a label with a lot of readings that we got from the, the databases, the library databases, just to select some recent readings on the areas, not prescribed by the lecturer, but to sort of entice students. So, you know, you have to an essay to write. Don't just stick with whatever you saw on the PowerPoint slides or the textbook go beyond that, that sort of thing. Excellent. Do you have a lot of um, materials in that space, meaning lots of links? Yes, we do. Yes. Uh -huh. It's just so, general reading. And as I said, it's not. So for instance, you might have a link that deals with a specific topic and then you might have two or three readings in the module, but this general library at the top. Huh? No problem. It's yeah. a, just about how it looks. I, I support the idea of the library, but I'm also thinking that I would love it might be intimidating. No, no, not intimidating. It's just how it looks. It might be lots of PDF files right behind each other mm -hmm. at the yes. top when you come in. 
yeah. and presentation wise it's a lot of scrolling down for the student okay, okay. So you can definitely keep that library but you could work with folders and you could drop readings in and you could categorize the folders just as you would do on your hard drive right so you have folders like readings um for unit one readings for unit two and um, past papers. So if you work with folders in that space, it's easier for students to navigate. Okay, That's folders, all right. Okay, and, and I'll see a link there saying use folders because I didn't see it. Yes, there. No, you can definitely create that one. So we're gonna go into a course now okay. and look at some of those. So can I just get a feedback? Is there anyone who doesn't know how to create um, any, create a resource? in Orgelly? Well, I would like to learn how to do folders. All right, I'm so let's do folders now then. I've used, I've used Orgelly before. I'm sorry, Ron, go ahead. I've used Orgelly before. You have? I once, I once did an online course for School of Education. Uh-huh, yeah. okay, so you have used it. Is there anyone who has never used it? I have a question for Olivine. Um, yes, go ahead. I have a question for Olivine, just asking her if in her library, whether she put her videos in that section or wouldn't it be better to put it in the, in the, in the section that's relevant to the video? I Would did include videos in the library, but yes, as I said, in every module, there were videos specific to the module, but the library did include videos. The thing is, it was trying to simulate a real library. You know, a real library has different sorts of resources. Oh. So it was doing that. That's but again, okay. it was an attempt to brand the HRD courses. All of them had that same kind of thing. You know, this, the course outline, the past papers, UE's plagiarism policy, those sorts of documents at the front. Then we had this online library, then we had some teaching aids. So it was just an attempt to have some uniformity there. That's a great idea. It's just how it looks. Olivine, are you logged into that course? No? Uh, no, I didn't log in. I was really just concentrating on what you were saying. I'll okay. play around after. All right, no problem. But, but I can always, we, we, can, I can, we can show. You yes, know? it would be great at some yeah. point. All right, so I'm going to go into my course and um, show you. And, and let's make this interactive. You can tell me which resource or which activity you want me to create, the ones that you might not be familiar with. Um, but I had asked a question before. Is there anyone who has never used RVLE? Anybody? All right, so everyone has used it. Excellent. All right, so first and foremost, you turn editing on. As you know, editing on is right here, and you turn it on. And when you turn it on, it will allow you editing privileges where you can know, right, where you can know, oh, messages, come on, ignore. <laughs> right, so you can know go in and do stuff. So let's see, I think the first thing that I'd like to show you is this edit setting right here, because some of you might not play around with the edit setting. When you click on edit setting, it actually allows you to configure your course umbrella, the outside of your course in a way. So where the asterisks are, you can't, it's, it's compulsory information that is needed. And then anything you're not sure about, these little question marks, they actually provide you with information about, about what the thing is. So don't be afraid to click on those question marks. So you have the start date for your course, and when you put a particular start date, that's from the day, from that day onwards, students can actually see the course. So students have been able to access this course from the 8th of September. If I change this to 20, 2021, my, student, my current students will no longer be able to see it because they'll have to wait until the 8th of September, 2021 to get into my course. Why I'm pointing that out, when you are actually working on your course spaces, particularly at the start of the semester, it would be good for you to um, go in and put the start date on the day when classes are supposed to begin. You know, so, you know, classes should begin on the Monday 
people are usually starting class at 8 a.m. You might want to make it available from 7 or something like that or midnight of that. I don't know. It's up to you. But keep students out of your course while they are doing the construction so that they don't see the guts of it. They don't get confused and those kinds of things. So fix that. Then in your course summary, you can integrate, uh, uh, what do you call it now, um, an image and um, you can use just text, this information. The text usually is what comes from your course outline, you know, just a description of your course. But when you integrate images, I'm gonna show you how to. So you put your cursor wherever you want to put it. I'm gonna just delete this now, just, no, do I want to delete this thing? No, I won't delete it. But you, these buttons, this one opens up the folder, the, the options for you. It closes it or opens up. Why I've opened it up is because sometimes you might want to center your image, right? To, for balance. And in online, I find symmetry is very important, you know, how it looks. So you center it and um, you can insert your image by clicking on that and you browse your repository, you go to where you have your images stored. I'm going into where I think I might have an image and I will try and find something and put there. So I have some graphics, maybe let's try food for thought, whatever that is. And I upload my food for thought, there it is. You'll have to check this one if it, it has a description, welcome. But what if I didn't have a description and I, I wouldn't be able to, I, uh, the thing wouldn't allow me to save. It would just keep coming back there. So I'd have to select this tick, description not necessary. And you can work on your size, you know, determine what size you want the thing or your auto size. I'm gonna work with auto size. If I didn't want auto size, I would uncheck it, but I want auto size and then I save image. And there it is, food for thought is right there. And um, you can put in whatever you want here. You can put a video there. You can put a, um, an animated graphic there, a, a GIF file. You can put something still life like this. It's up to you. It's limitless, right? And um, with your text, you can color code. You can highlight. You can do all kinds of interesting stuff right here. And this is what students actually see when they come into your course. I'm going to just save it just for you to see what I mean. So I save changes and um, let's see what happens. Um, all right, so what I do, I am gonna go back and search for my course and see how it shows up. Yeah, there's my course right here, and I click on it. So you'll notice now that that's how my, my course would look to students. When they log in on their Orville page, this is what they would be seeing, right? Is it looking good to me? Not quite, because the students can't really read the yellow well, and I don't need two graphics right there. I would only need one. But I wanted to just show you how you can change up the appearance of your course when students see it. So many persons might just have a blank folder, like a blank appearance like this. It doesn't have to be blank. You can actually make a difference in terms of how students see it by simply going in and changing, um, by going in and changing the setting, the edit setting feature, all right? So let's see, I wouldn't definitely need to change it by going into it. And ladies and gentlemen, Please don't feel that you're destroying Orville in any way when you do things. You're not because Mix has a backup of the files and they can possibly restore to a previous time. All right. So don't be so worried about doing technology. So I'm going to delete that and I'm going to change this back to black. And um, I should be okay from there. All right, so there it is, and I save my changes, and my course should be good again. All right, so now let's look at, we've turned editing on, and I want to look at how we're going to change up. So my course is kind of okay -ish. It's not finished. As you can see, 
up to that time at a pause there. So I now need to fix up the rest of my course. Now, the thing is, this course was taught by someone else before I came in it. I'm going to open the eye so that you can see it a little bit um, bold, more bold than what is. So there you have it. If you notice, it's a different kind of arrangement of the course space, different from what you saw above. And um, I'm going to show that as well. But what is happening here, it's two different um, persons working in the course space. Somebody worked in it before me, and this is how they did it. And I am now in it, but I'm more or less working with the same content, but I'm changing around the content to suit a style that I prefer working with. But it's really up to you to work with the space in the way in which you like to work with the space. So here we have them. Now, Olivine, here's a folder. And let's click on the folder. Let's see. There are the readings within the folder. There are four readings in there. All right. How do we create that? Let's see. Um, let's go. I'm going to always this is where you go to add an activity or resource within a unit so that's one unit topic eight is another is another unit and if I want to add anything anything to topic eight this is where I go to add it and it's the same thing topic nine is another unit and you know it's the same you go there and it keeps on going like that all right um, I tend to in my core because I'm coming into someone else's course space and I respect the fact that someone took the time to, to download materials and put it in the space and all of that. I really do not delete materials that are there because who's to tell maybe someone else, the person might come back to teaching the course next semester or next year. So I create a bottom, I create what is called, called an archive. And that's the last unit in my courses. And anything that I am not using in this unit, I move it to the archive. And how do I move stuff? Let's, um, hmm. you can move by clicking, you have options. You can click here to move it, or you can actually drag it and it moves with you. So you can drag stuff and it moves. And you know how to drag is just to hold it down. Um, put the cursor over it and you press down and you can move stuff to wherever you want. That's the easier way to do it. Uh, or you could simply click move resources and then this thing comes up and you can say whether you want it after such a resource or so on. And you can decide where. I find this a bit confusing when you have a lot of resources in there. So I tend to prefer to drag things. All right. So that's an option. So now let's add a resource. So here we have it, an activity or resource. So the activities are ways of getting students to apply knowledge. And you have a variety of activities. And then you have a variety of resources to show that students have, um, to give students content. So here's a folder. And we want to in, incorporate a folder. So we click that. And oh, before, before I, it's too late, I clicked it. Let me just back up a bit. Right, so add in. Right. What is important for, especially first timers or persons who are novices to this, you can know the range of a resource or activity by simply reading along here because or really it tells you what you can use it for. So they tell you that the folder module enables a teacher to display a number of related fields inside a single folder, reducing scrolling on the course page. A zip folder may be uploaded and unzipped for display or an empty folder created and files uploaded into it. So you can create your folder first and then you drop files in or you can you know, do it as you create a folder, you have options. You can even work with a zip folder. So you have variety. And this is how you can use the folder now. For a, send, for a series of files on one topic, for example, a set of past examination papers in PDF format, or a collection of image files for use in students' projects. So you can drop a couple of things in there if you want students to um, create something from it. Eh? 
So an, an interesting activity that just came to me could be where you can create, if you want students to work, if you're teaching them about visual literacy, you know, how you can communicate using vis, visuals. I can imagine a situation where I have a folder and I drop in a couple of visual things in there and I say to students, an, an assignment task could be um, look in the visual literacy folder and use any five images to create a story and, and then you know, write out that, the, meaning, the words of that story or the seek, write out the meaning behind the story. And I think that's cool because the students, when they log into that folder, all they'll be seeing are the visual things. And then I give them the activity now in terms of an assignment or a forum to do something. So this is what I mean when I say the folder it's a resource and you use it to give information to students, you know, to do something with, to apply knowledge. And they all, it's also to provide a shared uploading space for teachers on the course page, keeping the folder hidden so that only teachers can see it. So if it is that several of you teach one course, you can use a folder to share resources that, you know, individual um, teachers or lecturers will be using to teach their group in the space. So those are some of the options. So we add our folder and it's pretty simple as per usual. As per usual, sorry about that, that's my alarm. You name your folder, so I want to call it library. Um, and then you have to put something in here as well, whatever you wish. Wherever you see the red asterisk, we have to name, put something. And then if it is that we were going to put information in our folders from now, we could do it right here. And I tend to like the feature of dragging and dropping. So if I'm going to drag and drop, what I do, I have to re 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 um, reduce the size. I'm going to make it smaller. And if you notice, I've reduced it there. Um, and I'm gonna bring up my, I don't know if you're seeing my, my thingy, uh, my, are you seeing my, my folder where I store things on my fold, um, on my laptop, you might not be able to see, but I'm gonna drop and drag some things in there. Supposing, oh, well, here I go. I'm dropping and dragging something in. So you just simply drop it and notice my PowerPoint slide is in there. That's one thing in my folder. What if I wanted to put in a Word document there it is in my folder. I'm just going through my hard drive and I am dragging and just putting into my folder the different things that I, you know, that I, that I need here. All right. And there's really no limit around it. You just can keep going and going and going. All right. So imagine that that's all I want in my folder. So I'm going to now Create, finish creating my folder. So you have the option of how you want it displayed. They give you two. You want it on a separate page or you want it in line on a course. Let's look what on a separate page looks like. And that's what I mean about playing around, you know? So let's save and return to course. When you do that, you'll see what it looks like. So there is my folder called library right here. And in order to look at the contents of it, I have to open it up. And there are the contents of it, all right? I can edit my folder at any point here to put stuff in or take stuff out. So let's edit it. I want to see, what if I want to now add something else? Let's try and add, let's see how this thing works. We have to maximize our knowledge of a thing, all right? I wanna put this in there, literature, books. Mm. It's, ah, it's there, it went in a while ago. There it is, my literature book. And I, um, what other features can I change? Mm. So basically, um, let me max up the page again. So when I've created the folder, what I can do, I can add or delete stuff. Let's delete something because we just added something. We want to know how the delete process goes. So I click on it. I click on one thing and see it's giving me the option to delete it or even to rename it and a couple of other stuff. So I want to delete it. So let me delete it from my folder. It asks me, you sure you want to delete? Of course. And it's there. And I go ahead and save my changes. And voila, my folder is back to business. 
But there's one thing that I want to try though. I want to know which one you prefer. I want to know if you prefer how it looks when you have to click on the folder. Let's go down to unit seven. That's where we were. All right, so here we are in unit seven, um, the folder. I think I want to see how it would look stretched out because I'd have to op click on it to see the items. What if I want students to see the items at a ready glance? So I'm gonna edit it and change how it looks to students. And so instead of on a separate page, I want it in line on a course page. So let's see what that looks like. All right, so there it is. This is how it looks when you decide to do it in the inline feature. All right, so it's up to you which one you like and you organize it, all right? The only thing with this is that it takes up a lot of space, but it's also, at a glance, students can see what's in there. You, the lecturer, decide what it is that you want to do. So that's it for the folder. Um, hmm. I want to work with the URL now. Let's try a URL. And this is the one where you can actually link possibly to like a video. Um, all right, we want to link to a video. But hmm, I want to find a video. Let's find, I'm gonna just find a video. Um, hmm. Okay, let's go. Oh, not that. That perfect is what I'm talking about, this YouTube. So I will click on a video, I'll find it before time. And then I copy, I copy the URL, just like that, copy the URL. Download the MyFlow. All right, so I'm gonna close that because I've already copied the URL. And I go back now to my, where I'm linking to it. And you'll see right here, external URL, I control, and paste it in. What is control V? Right, I paste it in. If I didn't want to do that, I could go search in here for it, but that might be a little bit too long and slows up my computer. So I prefer to open a new window, find my video, copy the URL, and I put it in. So now I need to think about appearance. How do I want it to look when students come to it? Automatic means that the students are going to it's going to take over my page and I'm gonna show you what it looks like. Let's do that. When I say take over my page, when students click on it, yeah, they're not gonna be in Orville. They're gonna see Orville, but look what happens. See, no, notice now that they're no longer seeing the Orville features. They're taken School's to my out, video, and right? here for you with a best study partner. Visit flowstudy.co to start learning today. All right. Hello. Welcome mm. to Mercedes Benz. Lots of ads. You see how technology is because I know that people are online a lot. They're putting all these ads. I want my video. So here's my video, and students are now watching my video. Let's pause. Now, how do I get back to Orville? Is a question a student who is unfamiliar with Orville will ask because the student has been taken out now into YouTube and seeing all the different songs and you know, so the student will have to use the back button and we hope that the student is familiar with the back button to know to get back into Orville. A lecturer who wants to guard against a student getting lost or getting you know, caught up in other YouTube videos and begin to follow their fancy and go, go all over the place, you might want to present it in a different way. And you have different ways to do it. You could actually have worked with a label feature and embed the video into the label so that students, um, you know, they're not taken outside of Orville. But you also have it where you can, instead of the automatic, that takes them out. You can have it embedded, you can have it open, you can have it in pop-up. Let's try pop-up and see what pop-up looks like. I tend to like pop-up a lot. I use pop-up because 
I, I want to think that students can watch the video in another screen and still work in Orville and to do, and particularly if there's, a, there's an activity that they have to do. So I'm gonna click on it and notice now that the video pops up. So the students are taken to a different window totally to watch this video. And whenever they, they wish, they can minimize it and they can still be working in Orville and listening. And you know, so those are some of the options. And this pop-up remains until you close it. So that's what it is when it's pop-up. With embedded, I know that the actual thing drops into the page. So you can choose whatever you want to do in terms of how it looks, all right? Um, let's move on now to another resource. So oh, just to say to you, you, the book, you can actually create a book if you have, if you, let's select it and see there is if you want, if you have a multi-page resource. So if you want students, you have related materials that come across like a book, you can actually create that. All right. With the file, it's if you want to link to a PDF, a Word document, some other, a video, so many other things you can link to with the file. We, are, we looked at the folder. We can look at this content package. I've never used content package, but please, by all means, look to see what it does and you can explore with it. The label, we already know the label is very versatile, very, very versatile. And I even said you can insert the video, embed it into a label and they are right in the course space. The page works very much like a website. So you can, you get more variety with the page than you would get with, um, say, a, a file, right? Because you can manipulate. And the URL, we already know it's linking to any external thing like a video or um, another website or a database or something. You can go there, all right? So now those are the resources to bring content into your course. Let's look at the activities. As we know, everybody knows the assignment feature. If, do I need to go into the assignment feature? Anyone, I need to hear from you. If anyone wants me to create an assignment, please say yes or no. No, say yes. If I don't hear a yes, I can skip over it because everyone knows how to do the assignment. Yes, could you do assignment? Because um, the, 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 well, the university has asked us to change the assignments that we had before and create new ones. Excellent, all right. So I really wanted to hear your voices why I asked. <laughs> I'm troubling you guys. All right, so the assignment is important. Um, with the assignment feature, it's only you and the student who uploads will actually see the assignment, all right? Um, no other student can see another student's assignment, just the lecturer or the lecturers in the course and the student that student who uploads. So let's call this assignment, assignment one, right? That's what we're calling it. And we need to give it a name here. And maybe assignment one is a, it's a, it's a, it's a journal, All right? So you give it a name. And then if you notice here, you have to describe it. You have to give us all the information about the assignment. So I would go to my, um, to my course page, um, I, I would just probably just go there right now to just copy an assignment. I'm coming, oopsie, I'm, where's my assignment? Okay, here it is, journal. So I just quickly copy that, and then I just paste it in here. Control V, and it's pasted in. There I have my assignment fully explained, so I probably don't even, let's just, just, just put this, right? And I had it as a, what happens when I do that? Don't want that, all right? So, so reflections for e-journals, it's 30%, and I, I tell the students what it is, and you can fix it differently, why is it? All right, so I'm a stickler for alignment, so let me see if I can align it. It's not true. All right. So I'll play around with that a little bit more another day. 
Um, if I had time, I could align it properly, do it in Word and then here. So there's my assignment. And um, the students now know what it is that they must do. So when is it that they're to submit it? You can allow them to start submitting it from now, if you wish. And if that's the case, you keep the stick, keep the tick here and say from when they should start submitting it. I don't want them to start from no, so I don't want that. I want um, the due date, allow submission from, no, actually, yeah, like, you can't keep it or not keep it. it that's not important. Um, what is important is a due date. So by the due date, today is the 17th, and what Orvelli tends to do is they give you like a one week turnaround time. So, you know, I have, today's the 17th, it will automatically put you, put the 24th, another, the next week Friday for submission. I tend to give my students the weekends, you know, as they're working people, they're busy throughout the week and many of them get the work done on the weekend. So my time would more be like the 19th. So um, the, not the 19th, let's see. What's in, after the 24th, which is a Friday? So it would be the 26th. So I'm going to change the date and make it the 26th. And it's April. What if it were May that I wanted them to submit? And the year remains the same. And I have the time slot. I tend to give my students the entire day. So I go right on to the wire. 23, it's um, the military time that they use. 23.55, that's 11.55 p.m. I enable that. Now, the cutoff date is very tricky, guys. I would say think about it in terms of whether you have time. If you enable a cutoff date, it means that once you enable it, students and the date comes, so you might want to put a cutoff date as the 26th. No, if you're going down to, so it would have to be like the 27th, the next day. So after the, or it could be that same time, but it would have to be a little, not the same time, a little later. So let's see, you probably would cut it off. So come the 27th at one in the morning, you don't want anyone else to submit, right? So you put a cutoff date. The cutoff date, you'd have to think about it because once you put that cutoff date, students cannot upload anything beyond that date and time. So your students won't know what to do with it. So if you're the kind of lecturer who is hard and fast about a time and you're not taking any late assignments, no matter what, then the cutoff date will work for you. If you're the kind of lecturer who's, who would want to hear the story, why a student is submitting late, then don't enable cutoff date, take it off. Because what will happen is if a student submit, submits the assignment late, the system will accept the assignment, but the system will show you that Chantal Moore submitted one minute late, 10 minutes late, one day late. And for you now, the lecturer, to make that decision about whether you will mark it and apply penalty or don't mark it at all. You can just make a comment to say, it came in late, I'm not marking it. Depends on your, you know, your, your policy. But I tend to find that when you put the cutoff date and then you hear that somebody, you know, didn't have internet access or they got caught up in traffic or all kinds of story and stories that you want to bend back, you will now have to come contact the student and say, yes, um, let me open up the system and allow you to submit. So there's that time delay and isms and issues. So I don't tend to want to have to do that because sometimes when they call me, I might be at, in Timbuktu or something when I get their stories and I can't come to the computer at that time to make the change. So I prefer to leave it open, no cutoff date, but I will see that they have uploaded and they have uploaded late and I can choose what to do. It's your shock to decide. Um, the submission type, online text means the students can actually type right there in the assignment um, space or file submission, they have to upload. I tend to do both. Then you can put a word limit if you want. Um, you'd have to enable it if you're gonna put a word limit, you know, um, 10,000 words, you, you, you can put that there, right? Um, if not, you simply disable the word limit. 
how many pieces of assignment are they supposed to upload? Uh, some students might have to upload a Word document plus something else. If you know it's more than one, then please go ahead and, and select two uh, or whatever the number is. I tend to go a little bit you know, more because some students are strange, but you must know what it is you're working with. And the feedback type, I don't usually trouble that, but where you see comment in line, um, it simply means that as you are grading the student's work, you can actually comment within the space of what they're, they've written. The submission settings, I tend not to trouble that because um, attempts, you know, maximum attempts, mm, students, uh, you can, based on what you, the parameters you're setting up, but I tend to work with the standards. If they're working with group, the notification is, you know, as soon as you mark it and put the grade, the student gets the message. And this is the important one now, the grade. You need to put in the point, how much it is. Um, so it's a point thing. Um, maximum points, this assignment is worth 30%. I remember that. So it's 30, I put there. And the other things more or less remain unchanged. And then I click save and return to course. So when I save and return, this is what the assignment looks like. There it is, assignment one. When I, when I click on it or students click on it, they'll see the assignment. And I, the lecturer, I'm seeing that I have 25 students in this course. Nobody has yet submitted. Whenever anyone submits, these numbers will change. And when you have marked the assignment, this number will change. And here you have the due date and students will see the due date, all right? And if I had cut off date, they would also see a line with cut off date. And if I had enabled submit from, that would be there and so on. So this is what it looks like. I am going to try and see when I click on view, if I'll see anything, not quite. Um, when you have the option now, when the assignment is, when students submit the assignment, you can choose to, um, to download multiple, there should be another option here, which I'm not seeing it because no, the students haven't yet submitted, right? But in, hmm, yeah. So you can actually go in and download everything, right? If you so desire and so on. And it's gonna show 10 assignments at a time, all right? So that's it in terms of the assignment feature, ladies and gentlemen. And, and when you do the assignment to submit the grade to the office for it to go to exam section, how do we do that? All right, so there is not, um, it's, Orville has what is called a grade book, right? And um, when you mark a course, oof, let me see if students have actually submitted. I don't think they would have submitted in this one. When you mark a course, Orville has a grade book and you can download a grade book, but when you download a grade book, you still would have to know, you can download it as an Excel file. And when you download it as an Excel file, um, I can go into another course, but I don't know if I have the time. When you download it as an Excel file, you'll see all the students' names and for each assignment, the grades which are there, so with that Excel file, when you go into UA's banner system to put in your grades, you can actually upload that Excel file pretty easily if you wish. So there's no articulation, direct articulation between Orville and the banner. So you have to download from one, keep it on your jump, on your jump drive or wherever, then you go into banner and then you can upload the complete um, Excel and work with it across the two different um, platforms. Did I answer you, um, Olivine? Okay, yes, thanks. Right. Um, the thing is, I, I was speaking with a couple of lecturers earlier and they were worried about that, wanting to know about, the, but you've talked about students submitting their assignments directly into, mm -hmm. and um, I have a sec we need to clarify whether students will be allowed to submit assignments online as well as whether lecturers are allowed to grade online. That is one of the comments Ooh. that I'm reading here. Absolutely, lecturers can grade online. I am going to 
show you. And if you have any questions, please go ahead. Any other questions as I open up a space? Sir, there was one other question from um, Dr. Mason. She wanted to know if RVA Lee offers a space for private consultation with students. You've said that you are the only person, the lecturer is the only person who sees a student's essay. But what but if I want to talk feature. to a student? For the assignment feature, yes. um, you can talk to a student by creating that space, right? Um, so it, it is not automatic. You have to create that space. So like a consultation space, it's not real. It's asynchronous conversation. If you want to do a real conversation in real time with students, you can actually work with a chat feature. So let me look at assignments and quickly show you what I mean. So here's an assignment that um, students would have submitted already, right? And um, if you notice this assignment, 17 students um, in the course, 15 submitted, and I've and 10 needs grading. So I've already started the grading process. So I'm going to click on grading to continue my grading. And this is what Orville kind of looks like. All right. So here you have it, the student's assignment. You can click on it here. That's one way. Or you could have actually downloaded it before. Let me show you what I meant when I talked about downloading. So when you here, you can view all submissions. And then right here for grading it, you can download all the submissions. So if you click this, all the students who submitted this particular assignment will be presented as a um, a PDF, uh, sorry, a zip folder. So if I save that, all right, um, I now go into grade the student's work. Let me find somewhere that I've not yet graded a student's work. So here is Roxette, and I'm going to grade Roxette's work. So Roxette's work hasn't yet been graded. So I can open it up here, or I can actually go to my zip folder where I had it. Um, I, you'd have to kind of remember where you do your thing, right? I think I had it in. Um, Is it possible to write comments on the assignment in Orville? You can if you select inline. Inline. Um, if you'd have to select the inline option. And I think it's more the assignment, not the word one, but where they actually type it in the, you so see you'd have to select the, the typing in the space and the inline one. I tend not to use that feature, but you can explore and see what it is, but you can. Um, so for me, I would go in and find a student's assignment and then open it up. Oh, sorry. And then I can comment. So let's try it. Here's a student's work. Open it up right here. It's forcing you to save it. So you would open it. And when you open it, here's Roxette's thing. You, you can type in there. But when you type in here, what is going to happen is that, um, and you can even use the comment feature and do stuff, right? The insert and the comments and you do things with it and you know, and so on. But you will have to now save back this work. You'd have to save it. And when you save it, that's when you can re-upload it. So you're not allowed to do what you can type within the student's work, but it's, um, it's saved back as a Word document and then you you can now go in and re-upload right here in the feedback column. Right here, you, um, you can give feedback to students. Uh, you can give your feedback here. You can expand the window to give feedback. 
it's not allowing me to give feedback when I expand. Anyway, so you expand it and you, or you give the feedback right in there and you can give the grade. Suppose a student got um, 15 out of 20, you give the grade there and you can save and so on, right? So those are some of the options which are available to you. And you can actually, if the student had typed within the assignment page, this is where the student would have been, would have done it. And then you could do your editing to it. So this is the inline editing which could possibly happen in this space here. And then you can grade it and then you can, you can move on. And to move on, you can Thank you. save and show next or you can save it. It's up to you which one, all right? Okay, thank you. Yes, you're welcome. So I'm not going to save it because I don't want to give the student a heart attack when she logs <laughs> Um, well, save and show next would be that it moved to the next paper to the, that needed grading. I'll do it there and I'll show you. There it is. So it moves on now to the next student, which is Amanda Jackson. So when I click this back button, I'm going to go back to Roxette and you'd have seen Roxette's comment. She's gotten her 15. So I'm going to delete that and you would have given the comments here. So I can save it. And I have now a clean space and I can move on to the next and so on. And you can go back and edit stuff that you have worked on. So for example, Connie, I have given Connie a grade and I've got given her feedback and so on. So I could actually go in and make changes to it right here if I wanted to or not, right? So there it is. Um, I, just to mm -hmm. ask one question, those comments that you made were for an assignment that was submitted in a file format, not in the inline format. Correct, correct. Okay. Right, so please go ahead and play around with the inline and see what it's like, right? Mm -hmm. You will only know when you play around with it, right? So just in terms of, um, the, I think, I'd, I'm not sure how long I have, and I think I need to wrap up now with you guys. So I don't want to keep it longer than you need to because well, dinner is waiting. Two but things, two things. Um, one, the, the question Dr. Mason left, she would like to know if RVLE allows for the creation of private space for office hours. Sure, yeah. She's currently using a chat for this purpose, but it allows other students to join. And if she's having a discussion with a student, which should not be interrupted, that can be a problem. And the second thing, the real tool that we need the external, is to use Blackboard Collaborate. Get in there and set up a class. Blackboard. No problem. So the chat actually is open to everyone. I don't think it restricts or excludes students. So you have to create a private space and the only private space that it, it, it doesn't work like that. You can lock, you'd have to lock students out. I'm sorry, chats, you, they can all come in. If you say, the thing too, you can create a chat space and you can say, Olivine, I want you to meet with me on Saturday at 2 p.m. So only Olivine, you would give that information. So Olivine would come in at that time and you and her would be in there, no one else, right? So that's the thing that can happen if you don't want everyone in your chat at that time, all right? So Blackboard Collaborate is in the external tool. That's where you find it. And you click add. And with it, you give it a name. This is your meeting room for your course. Now, you have to take it off the automatic and select Blackboard Collaborate Ultra. Now, if you tend to save passwords and so on in Chrome, this is automatically going to come up, right? Because I've saved my password to access Orvelli. So I have to back, I have to delete that, right? You must remove that or else your Blackboard will not work. It you will create the page, but it's not gonna work for you or your students. So make sure that in the launch URL, you have nothing there. And you must click on show more because you need to take out the shared secret. You don't want that there because if you keep it, your students will not get into Blackboard, it won't work. So it's very simple. You 
get rid of the 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 launch url your id number that might be there and you show more and you get rid of the shared secret all right so then you can go on now to do other things uh, if you want privacy i usually keep that the tools i usually keep that in terms of restrict access i tend not to the restrict access is really where students cannot get in unless they do something it's an if factor but i want everyone in so i save and return to course so when i've done that i've actually created my blackboard I don't want, never, I don't want you to save it for me. So now I have my meeting room. So what students will do, they will click on it when they come into your course. And when they click on your meeting room, this black screen with the circle is going to happen. And um, if you notice, there are many meeting rooms already, right? I have three meeting rooms, one, two, and three. But these, um, I don't, need these these are all ones so you can really delete them this is my meeting room if you notice it says the course room all right so you can create several rooms in there if you want but you really don't need so many if students are going to be logging in um if students are going to always log into to, to that space. So you don't need as many meeting rooms, ladies and gentlemen. So just this one is enough and you click on it when students will click on it and get in there, right? So when you click on it, notice over here, which says join course room. This is where students will click to join the room. But I want to point it to a couple of things on this side here before they join the room. You can do a couple of things. So set up the parameters for your meeting room the guest link is very important um when you click on it you're actually copying the guest link you copy it and the reason why you can copy the guest link is that you can send it to in an email to students particularly if students do not if students are having ac access problems to or vle to get in through that door you can actually just send copy the guest link and in a in your email you can send them, you know, when you create your, your email thingy, you compose your email and you can actually send them the guest link. You can send it to them and that's what they will use to access the course without going through our All right. So that's one thing that you can do there. Um, oopsie. All right. So another thing over here that you can do, you can set up the role, your role, um, your role, my role is that as participant. You can choose to be moderator, presenter. You can choose to do that. I'm going to set it up as, um, I'm leaving it as participants so that those who come in, the attendees, they're participants. Um, if I want it to be recorded, I can set up the recording over here if I wish and decide, you know, I want to record my messages and so on. And then permissions, show profile pic for moderator only. You can choose to, you know, work, select that. And then the participants can. Do you want your participants to be able to share audio, sh share video, and post chat messages? If you want it to happen, you keep these ticks, all right? So I'm fine with as is, yes? I'm seeing the student page where you're marking the assignment and not. Yes, yes not. Oh, seriously? Yes. Oh, no. Sorry about that. So I've been going all along and you're not there. Oy. No, man, that was like a minute ago. We didn't see it or less. Oh, okay. Cool. Let me just go back into my thing. All right. Are you seeing the Blackboard Collaborate screen now? Great. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. All right. So I was saying to you that I have many things, but this is a room that I want to enter in. I've selected it. Select the room. That's where my students are meeting me. And students will just click join course room to get in. But you, the lecturer, you can set up some other things that you wish along here. So the guest link, you can copy it if you wish. You can actually tell the recording ahead of time that you want it recorded. You can decide the, the privileges that you allow your participants and so on. Do you want them to be able to 
have private chats while they're teaching? If you do, you enable it. Is it that you want you, the moderator, to supervise all private chats and it goes on like that? So, because I haven't changed anything, I don't need to save. I'm just gonna join my course room. So there is my course room. And you know what? I should really send you guys the meeting link for you to join me. I could have you join me in the meeting room, but let me not do that because we're working with Zoom. We can, but I don't want to complicate. So nobody's in my room right now. Um, can I send to maybe one person to join me? Where's my, I think I closed out my email. Oh, all right. It's already too late. I closed out my email. All right. So this is a meeting room. And it's question, question. Earlier, the, 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 there was the idea of using Zoom to have like a uh, synchronous conversation or a class or like an hour or so. What would then be the difference with using that option and Blackboard Collab? All right, you Zoom is, you can do free Zoom for up to 40 minutes. Everybody can create a Zoom for, um, account and you get 40 minutes to meet with persons with a number three or more in your meeting room once you have three or more persons the zoom automatically gives you 40 minutes so if you want to do one and one then zoom doesn't they give you like an hour or more so if you want to meet with students one and one and the zoom might be it and you can send students your link and you meet them there because zoom is free that you can sign up for you can also do it in Blackboard where you tell your students what time you and them can be in there because the Blackboard meeting room remains open unless you close it. So you can do it there. Right here, no. You can tell students, come in at 6.30. Um, Rowan, come in into the Blackboard room. You and I will have a conversation. The thing with Zoom, though, is that if you want to have a class longer than 45 minutes, it might mean that you have to pay for it. And Zoom is not a part of Orville. It's not one of the external tools. It's Blackboard, which UE has paid for. So you, Blackboard is UE's tool that you use for synchronous communication, right? Ah, oh, so ah, so now I get it. So Blackboard is is built into into Orville. It's built into Orville. Yeah. Uh, so it's a similar it's a similar kind of chat forum for presentation and stuff. It's just that this one is built into. Exactly. And, and this one is actually more suitable for teaching because with Blackboard, you have so many options. Like, look at it here. When I open the panel, right, you, you can share. And when you share, see you have a blank whiteboard. You can actually write on the whiteboard. Here's your whiteboard. And you can actually um, type text on the whiteboard. You can actually erase from the whiteboard, you can actually point and stuff. You have a pencil and you can write on it, do stuff on it. But Zoom doesn't allow you all of these. So I think Blackboard is more suited as a teaching space. Um, also with Blackboard, you can have breakout groups. Over to my right here, you'll see breakout groups where you can actually set up different groups within and group members, so students can be meeting outside of your space, right? So that is definitely doable, all right? Um, and then you can have them do polling as you are um, teaching. You can ask them to say, are you with me? And they can choose, you know, they can do multiple choice things. They can give yes and no answers. And um, yeah, you do have the chat with Zoom. You do have participants, but even within here, like, um, yeah, yeah. Have so a question? Mm-hmm. Go ahead. For the Crawford Brown, I just wanted to find out um, about that issue you raised regarding a guest, the guest. The guest um, name? Yes. Ah, I was just thinking, if you have a guest lecturer. Perfect. Oh. Perfect. So you you are oh, teaching um, would it, would it by by the way that you yeah you are teaching and you want someone from England to join your class your class you're teaching from say five o'clock to seven o'clock and you want someone to join your class at six you can right. take the link and send it to the person in England and say join us at six so the person will 
enter your class, even though the person is not a U elector or anything, they will okay. be into using the link. So that is what that is all about. That's I was, what I was about. thinking. Okay, cool. But I'm also thinking about your students who, and I shouldn't say this out loud, and and um, it's being recorded, but I'm also thinking about students who might not have regularized payments. And at this time, I'm sorry, I'm going to turn on the light. And at this time, it might be difficult for them. Yeah, it might be difficult for them to get on. So maybe it's a way to decide that you will allow in a student no until they regularize. Oh, okay. well, the principal has said that the university is going to sort of relax some of those. So, regulations right isn't it relaxed when they've paid semester yeah. one and all miscellaneous fees i'm not sure i'm not sure what his new arrangements will be but he said that in the faculty of social sciences faculty board meeting wonderful oh. so if that's the case you're good so it's more appropriate for like a guest lecture then mm -hmm. well, okay. I'm, not, I'm not certain that that has been implemented yet though you know but and but if it's not yet implemented and you want to allow all your students in this week next week you can give them a guest link and then say sort yourself out or until ue totally relaxes the thing but since we know that ue intends to then you can yes go ahead and um also with blackboard collaborate you can use video so i am now enabling the video um, video preview you're about to start looking good share when you're ready to, for others to see you it's not allowing me to share i don't know if it's because i'm sharing within share but you can use video within blackboard as well all right and the audio and stuff like that the one other thing that is important to blackboard if you notice where my my cursor is now this tab it's important that you know this tab because it's this tab that you need to click on to start recording if you had not set it for pre-recording you can with pre-recording once anyone logs in it starts recording until everyone logs out with the with this way when you start recording you can wait until everyone is in the space then you can click on recording and when you want to stop it so that you know if you have other private housekeeping matters you can stop your recording when you're done so you can start your recording and you'll see that the little recording icon is there and telling your recording is in progress and then you can stop your recording right so don't forget that and um some other little thingy but the only important thing here is the recording for me all right so this is, is a black or, is it a stop or a pause mm -hmm. is it a stop or a pause because stop suggests to me that you have to start a new recording and you have like two clips or two recordings versus one recording all right so let's look at it i think it's stop so here you have recording in progress and then notice that it just gives you the stop, the stop right not pause but stop, the stop. Up, yeah, so right. right so what will happen is when students log out all right um they actually when you come out of it they they can now go and find a recording by clicking back that same thingy um i don't know why i've started using that word thingy but it can click this label here or tab and notice the recordings are here so you click on it and then it's no recordings within the past 30 days so i've not done any recordings in here because i've been using zoom but when you click it the recordings which are there you should see them all right yeah you should see the list of recordings there all right any but other Somebody's asking if you can show how to share a video again. Somebody's asking um, that. Okay, sure. I'm not, it didn't work for me because I don't know if it's because I'm sharing within Zoom and Blackboard is not allowing me to do a double share. Right? So I'm going to probably, but I'll show you the steps. So when you get into the course, you enter the course, you join the course room. Oh, that's the other thing with the recording. It doesn't record until everyone has logged out of the Blackboard room. 
So you have to make sure that every student jumps out so that when they jump out and you close off Blackboard, that's when the recording becomes available. Yeah. So how do you do video? Just like with Zoom, you see right here at the bottom of the screen, you have your pick, you have the microphone icon, you have the video icon, and you have the raise hand. So yes, that's the other nice thing with, um, with, with Blackboard. Students can actually raise hand, but it's also in Zoom. All right, so share video. You click on the share, the video preview, and then it will ask you, it says, you know, you're about to start sharing your video. And this thing here, you should be able to click on it to share video. But it's not allowing me now to do it because um, I'm not sure why it's not. I don't know if it's because I'm sharing video within a video, but I'll have to jump out and see why that is so, all right? So that's how you share the video. Oh, when you say share video, are you referring to like a PowerPoint or? Show your video of you. I'm not sure that wasn't part of the question. Okay, uh, but wait, hold on, hold on. The person seems to be coming back. No, not of me. Okay, perfect. Well, if it's um sharing a video right here, you're seeing my cursor down by the bottom right of the screen. Share content. You would click on share content, and then you would share your. You can share files where you don't, where you pre-upload like your PowerPoint or you share your application screen and then you go and find it. But I'm going to tell you one thing that I found with Blackboard Collaborate. If you're going to share uh, an external file, like a, a, something on the internet, like a video or a website or something on the internet, you have to open a different browser. Because if you don't, you're going to get like a window with several windows within each other. So it doesn't work well when you are trying to open, a, a, when you're trying to open an application using the same browser. I'm gonna show you what I mean. So if I click this and I click share, um, you see that? Are you seeing several boxes opening like a, a view? Like you're yeah, looking? Yeah, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, that is what always happens. So when I checked with MITS on this, they said you need to open a different browser. So I'm actually using Chrome right now. So in order to, for me to do this, I'd have, I'd have to open like Explorer or one of a, another browser and then you, share you find the screen that you want and you click on the explorer and that's how could, it's done differently all right or, or you could um download the video to your computer and have it on your computer and you could share files in that way yes. right so you the share the files so you'd have to add the files drag and drop it in here and then you can now share it once you do so all right um let's see um and, and one other thing for me too, when you just came in, we had mm -hmm. this um, start session. Right. So, because you, you are showing us a session that is already in progress, but do we have to do start session and then upload all our PowerPoints and all the things that we plan to show for that day into a thing? How do we start a session from all scratch? Right. You mean from in, in Blackboard? Yes, uh -huh. because when you just came in, we saw a thing about start session, but you had had several sessions, so you started using those. But um, when I was trying, okay. I didn't know what to do after pressing start session. Uh, all right, I'm coming. Let me just quickly, to add a file, I'm just quickly checking on something. All right, let me just see it to add a file there. Okay, so I'm just trying to make sure. So when you add a file, it takes a little while to, to do it. So you will need to kind of preload your things, you know, and, and so on. So here you have it, share now, let's see. So you click it and there your file is there to be shown to your students, all right? Um, let me get out of that and show you now what you were asking about. 
So I'm closing off Blackboard. Um, Olivine, so you're saying when you go into a course, you want to be in a course where you don't sorry. So right here, Olivine, we have created it. Yes. And we click on it. So when you click on it, the meeting room opens. And um, that button saying create session. And then also, how do I do um, groups, like small groups? So I want the students in groups and then I want to bring them back to the main plenary. Right. So that's, that's with the breakout, Olivine. You would have to, when you're in there, uh, I would have to get a blank course space, right? For you to not see these down here, or I'd have to delete them. Right. I have created the Blackboard session and this is where you'd go to get in. And when you're in it, Olivine, when you join it, uh, the thing is, though, I'm supposed to have uploaded all my my um, PowerPoint slides, my files, anything that I wanted to share for that session. I have them waiting. Okay. I, that is my creation of session, and I have my my whiteboard ready and all of that. That is, you know, mm -hmm. how do I? create a session you, you, you understand it's not the technicalities of no, it i understand what you're asking olivine i understand because doc when she opened i saw her quality or qualitative research course da 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 right mm -hmm. here introduction to quad but how did she do that all right so i'd have to find a course that i don't have anything created guys so let me see let me find such a course mm. Maybe in this one. I think I have a blackboard in here. Oh yeah, I do. Um, I need a space where I don't have a blackboard created. What else? Then maybe it's now time for us to bring up one of our courses. Yes, you could do that. Let me, let me that would be great. Olivin, I just think I saw what happened. Okay. So, so once you enter the course, and created the blackboard. The, it seemed the course material automatically got reflected in the, in the blackboard space. Once you have it there, it will keep, it will show. Ah, oh, I don't think already that... created in RVLE, mm -hmm. and she, created, she opened the blackboard. And once the blackboard is open, then you could see the course content and all of that through the blackboard entry. Yeah, let's let me just quickly see. And and the thing is, you just need to play around sometimes. Just set a time to play with it. Okay, so Blackboard is now here in this course. Let's see what happens when we get in there. Okay, so this room, this course, this course space has never had a blackboard. So if yes. you know, this is only one thing now. So when you create it and click on it, this is the door you see. It's unlocked. Right, right. So right. when you click so, on it to enter it, Olivine and others, you join the course room, right? You can. And um, so even the lecturer joins the course room. Everybody has to. Okay. So you join it. And when you join it now, I just hope I'll remember to go and delete these things that I'm creating all over the place. All right. All right. So you join it and there you have it. So you share screen. You can, you notice I don't have any files in this course room. And that's, I think that's what Ron was trying to point out to us. What happens when you don't have any files in there. All right, so back. And this is your breakout groups now. It's gonna be hard for me to create breakout groups, Olivine, because what will happen is I will need to, when students join me in you this- You need to actually have people in the class. I have, have people in the room so I can put them, you know, in different groups. Oh, yeah. What I would say to you is try it. And when you are doing it, if you have any challenges, then you can, you know, maybe you could invite me into the room. I could probably, you know, let me know and I could work with you if anything. Okay, so, that's wonderful. I heard one of the presenters that you have to 
place each person, literally each person in a different um, in a different group. So if you have 20 persons and you want four groups, you have to select the person and actually place them. Right, because I think the names are here or somewhere along here. Now that I don't have anyone in, I can't really, because it's not, I don't really work with breakouts as much. But the other day we did it where we invited persons in and I could, we could move students into the groups. But it allows you to do it in here. Hmm. Yeah. Yes, go ahead, um, Ron, you were saying? No, I was, I was trying to find out if the link that you were making earlier in terms of sending or, or inviting somebody to a group, would that be what would actually allow? So take, for example, if you added or if you invited six of us, would that be the option that allows you to then put the six of us in two groups? No. Once you log into the course, into the meeting room, that's when I can put you in groups to break out. Okay, so it's, it's, it's a matter of the person you being be locked in, in. Yeah, okay. you have to be in the room. Right. And then you decide how you want to group them in the space. The question though is because as it is now, could we, and what would be the option for us to log into your course there per se, or would you have to actually invite us? All right, I just signed in. Already. I just saw where someone is saying, send us the link and let us join you in the room. All right, so. If you guys have time, I can spend a few more and let's do that. So let me just quickly get the link and... Um, and right, because that was the thing, whether or not you would have to invite us or whether or not it would be an open space where once we see, you know, once we know we're in that class, we just automatically join. Let's try it. It's in the chat space. You can copy it and join me. Yeah. Oh, great. I'm seeing people in the meeting room. Welcome, guys. Welcome. All right. So let me share screen so that you can see my screen. All right. So this is, this is what's happening now. And if you notice, let's go back to Right, so I want to go into share content and on the share content here, we have the breakout group. So when we click on it, if you notice now, we're seeing two groups of three attendees. Um, the main room, I have Michelle and Chantal. We have a group one and we have a group two. So they have actually randomized the group for me. It has run, you know, and this is a main automatically put up in, put us in groups apparently because random Deep assign system. because that's what i've selected but i could custom assign it so when you random assign it bb blackboard collaborate does it for you i could choose to include me in the group or not right number of groups because i have two it randomly has, um, assign it if i have three groups let's see it divides it no it breaks it up more. So you're, everybody see what's happening here? Right. Everyone is with me? Yes. So, right. so what I was actually yes. thinking earlier is the same thing. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. So and which then, means, which means you would actually have to share, share the, 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 the room with persons rather than them just joining automatically, it seems. Oh, no, Ron, I, the students in their Orville course, they could enter regularly by clicking on, they will see the door to enter. We would need to send them the link if they're registered students in Orville, but if they're not, ah, like ah, that, ah, you have to send okay. them the link. That's fine, yes. Okay. Right. Okay. And once they enter now and you click on, how do you get to here? You click on this, they share. All right, back up. You go back here. So it's on the shared content. This, I, this icon here, the share content, and then you click on breakout groups. And when you click on it, you decide how you want your groups assigned. It's 
default is the random assign, but if it were custom assigned, let's go to custom. So what will happen now is I would have to show all the members and I decide where they go. So there you go, you put them in group one or group two for each person, it does that. So you would put them, all, these are all the people in the main room, right? So you do that. All right, it, it, is it making sense? A lot, a lot. Right, so I, I guess to make it easier, you can do the custom assignment. Yeah. You want to select persons where you want them or the random. The easier one to me is the random and you can definitely flex between, between it. And you decide how many groups you want, whether it's three groups, four groups, based on the number of students that you have. Right, and the random breaks them up like that. So if I click now on start, right, that's, let me go into bigger groups. Let me try and have three groups instead. I'm gonna work with two groups, random assigned. I'm, I can allow you to switch groups or I can keep you where you are. I'm gonna keep you where you are. You can actually shuffle the attendees. It's, it's very flexible, right? And um, And so now, if I click start, the students are actually in their breakout groups. So let me understand a little bit more. So take, for example, that you give persons a topic to discuss. Mm -hmm. Just like we do in face-to-face -face class where we may give them a topic to discuss, right. give them some time and then come back to, to, to report on what they have discussed in those groups. It's the same concept that we're dealing with right here. Correct. It's the same concept. And um, the question now is, how do you get everyone back? And break, break all groups, you close it off, and everybody is back there. All right? So it's the same concept indeed, Rowan. So you okay. get to go off in their separate spaces, and they're discussing. You, the moderator, you can move between the groups if you want. and um, you can actually stay away from the groups as well. And um, you give them the timeline to do their groups and then you end the groups. Everybody saw the processes that we were going through or should, should I just walk it through one more time? Could you walk it through again? Somebody asked to walk it through again from setting up the Blackboard Collaborate. So the external tool to go from there. It's no, no, doc, doc. Just make sure that we don't have to call you every day. I know, but I feel so guilty being here, having you guys on this thing, you know? No, All right. man. What, what no, Alevine, dog, just, no, please. Just, just to add, Ali, Olivine, and you are on the, the, the other session. That, but I'll go back and look. There was a space that they had suggested to us that we could go and play, quote, no. unquote. So I'm gonna try and go back and find that link and share it so that you know persons can, nice. can go right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, so doc, doc, I can walk me. it through to you. No problem. I can walk it through with you. So you would set up your Blackboard space by when you're in your course. Um. You turn your editing on, and then you. Go here, you click on add an activity or resource, and you can set up your external tool. That's the other thing too, guys. Let me show you something. You don't need to always set it up. You can set up one right here. Right here, when you click on Blackboard, you only need to create one Blackboard um, thing, one Blackboard space in your main room. And when you create that one Blackboard space, then you can now create other sessions if you wish or you can just keep your one session. If, you're, if your students are always going to be coming in on a Monday at five, they can always just come in here. You don't always have to set up one every Monday. You only do this like if you, you only create sessions like if you have a course that is taught by three different lecturers, then you can create a session now to say, let me create one for this new session is called, um, suppose it's um, Dr. Johnson. Right, and you can set that up for Dr. Johnson, right? And you, you, you do your thing. So notice Dr. Johnson's session is set up. 
and then you can create another session now for um, um, create another session for Mrs. Jones. So what will happen is that the students who belong to Dr. Johnson will join here. The students who belong to Mrs. Jones will join here. So when the students enter, they'll see the rooms and you can actually make it more, you can actually be more specific. Like you could say, Mr. Mr. Clark's meeting room. And you can tell the day Mondays at 4 p.m. And you save that. So there they have it. They know that, you know, you can edit the, the thing. So we can edit it to Mrs. Jones meeting room. Um, Tuesdays at four. So you have that kind of versatility. So you set these up and you save them. All right, so there you have the two different meeting rooms. So if it's a course taught by several lecture, lecturers, you can have different meeting rooms. And especially if they're meeting all on the same day, suppose everybody's meeting on a Tuesday at four, then the students who are for Miss Jones will, Mrs. Jones will go here. The students who are for Mr. Clark will go here. So you have those kinds of versatile ways, right? And then once you have created your course meeting room, you go in it by clicking on it right here, click on it. And when you click it, you'll see join session. You click and you join the session and the session loads and you get in there. Um, okay, so this meeting room is empty because no other student is in it. Every, it, on a regular, um, because students know the time, which is Tuesday, Tuesday at four, they would all come in. So you'd have people in here with you. And if you want to do breakout groups, if you want to share, this is the tab that you click on. And this is your chat room. This is your participants. This is where you share screen or use a whiteboard or have your breakout groups. If you click breakout groups, nothing is going to happen now because Chantal is the only one in this meeting room. All right. So that's the problem there. Okay, guys. But in my other room with you now, I definitely can have breakout groups. I can have breakout groups because we have how many persons in this room? Seven attendees in this room. There it is telling me the seven people who are in the room. So if I want to have breakout groups, I click on that and here's my breakout group thingy. Do I want to randomly assign them or do I want to custom assign them? You decide with it, the number of groups you want. And then you can even shuffle it up and you can allow them to switch or not switch between groups. And you, as a person, the lecturer, you can have access to go into all the, the different groups, all right? And um, you can even move them if you so wish, as, even if they're there. And you start, you have to start your breakout groups. Once you click on start breakout groups, persons are no longer in the main room. They're in their breakout groups. The system moves them in. And um, Rowan, what are you seeing right now? So I'm seeing main room. Uh-huh. And do you see or the student, the persons in your group? So uh, I'm not sure if I oh Alicia. You're Alicia. in one with Alicia, right. And that then you have a group two. Um group two, uh, only one person, Olivine, see Olivine. No, no, three, Myrtle. Claudette and uh, Olivine. Exactly. And so people are meeting and doing their thing. The only reason why you're hearing me now is because we're actually talking on Zoom. But if you were in Blackboard, you'd be able to, if this, if I weren't sharing through, you guys could talk and have and do your thing and use whiteboard and all of those. And then if I if I say to you that you can meet for half hour, when the half an hour is up, I can now end the breakout groups by clicking there's a black screen a black 
rectangle at the top right under the word attendees so I can actually close it out or you can see you know breakout groups you can do that you can update it or I can close it end the breakout group so when I end it everybody is back in the main room as a big class to talk again all right okay yes uh there was a question go for can, it um can you show how to select weekly sessions weekly sessions um you'd have to go back into your course space and when you go back into your course space then you will have your sessions that you have created right so it's when you click on your on a session it takes you into a new window in your browser um, you see a new window so if you're looking up here you'll see that I have two blackboard windows open I have Myrtle Jones Mrs. Jones's and I have the main course one with with us we're in the main course one and that is Miss Jones's one all right so and if you want to go back to your orderly screen you have to just go into the other window so blackboard takes you outside of or VLE for you to be in the rooms am i making sense have i lost you guys hello no no you haven't no you haven't yeah we're here I'm processing. <laughs> yeah we're here it only looks complicated because you haven't tried it. But when you're in there, it's kind of intuitive and you will remember and you'll get there. All right. But you have to have people in the room with you in order for you to, to be able to break out. And remember, you don't have to break out even, you know, you don't have to. Because students can take turns and present in the main group as well. All right, so any questions or concerns? Oh, yeah, Rohan has One shared thing, the yeah, right. for us. Right. I, I just went into it as well. It's, it's, it, it seems very nice. Yes, nice. There, there are questions and answers and other stuff to read. And I think I also heard that there was like some videos or something like that, or a, a space that you can play. Yes. So I, I'll check it out. Mm hmm. All right, so definitely check out UABBC as Ron has um, given us the link so we can check it out right there. Thanks a lot, Ron. Question. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can, Opal. Um, I wanted to find out the multiple screens happened to me on Tuesday. Ron. I'm sorry, the multiple screens happened to you on Tuesday? Right, when I was trying to share my screen. Yeah, as I said, how you get around that? Yes, the multiple screen screen will happen if you're trying to share using the same browser. You have to have two browsers open on your computer, and you share in the browser where you're not logged into BBC. So if you use Chrome, make sure you open Explorer or something else, or Firefox or some other browser. And you link, you you share the screen. When you're sharing screen, it will actually show you the different um, browsers that are open. So you will select the the Explorer one and and find whatever you want inside there. Okay. I just, I suspect this this link that this link that I shared earlier will actually help us to determine which of the browsers to use. I think I recall from the session that I attended. Explorer. The, the Explorer is the best one? That's what they say, but I'm used to Chrome, so I just Chrome, use Chrome. Yeah, I'm used to Chrome as well. Yeah. But yeah. they said that one is one is the better browser to use. It's, it's Explorer, they say that's the better one. I tend to use Chrome because all my passwords are in there and all of that. Yeah. Try Explorer, maybe when you use Explorer, you won't get those framed windows. You know, try it. Try it. Okay. Good. Thank you. All right, guys. Hope um, I know many of you are. As I start, when I started, I say people are at different stages, and even with our presentation, there I, I wanted to talk about how you engage, but I'm, I think I might have touched on some of them, not everything. 
you know, but in terms of engagement, just to say that, think about how long your class is going to be. Your face-to-face -face class is usually, say, a three-hour span. Don't do this synchronous thing as we're doing for three hours. We started at five and it's now seven. And trust me, I think now's the time to wrap up. People need to move. So you should only do a three hour thing. Like if it's a presentation, blend your thing so that you have a, a combination of synchronous and asynchronous so that students can cover the three hour span without necessarily sitting down. Remember too that some persons are joining your students, they're using paid data. Some of them don't have like the Wi-Fi at home where they pay one flat rate. Some of them are paying as they go. So think about how you're going to manage your course for to, to cater to students' um, needs and you know what they have. Also, when you design your units, make sure you have a reasonable mixture of resources. Not all, you know, just um, PowerPoints or not all PDFs. Let students, after they've read a, poor, uh, a PDF something um, document, how do they know engage with a forum activity or even with a, a breakout thing in, in Blackboard Collaborate? You can sometimes link it in those ways for them to organize and do things. And also allow students to collaborate within Blackboard, within Orville. Set up your tasks so that students can um, Students are finding time to um, students are finding time to talk among themselves, share among themselves. Sometimes it's good for you to to create groups in RVLE. For example, the you know the task get the students to have a lead, and they, they go off and do things, or they or they post and have the students themselves doing the commentary because some of you need to be concerned that you don't burn out yourselves. I find that as lecturers, sometimes we think that we are the ones who should be doing everything when the students are the ones who should engage. So I would encourage you to um, set up your classes so that students are leading some of the discussion forum. And right. you have to be the one reading everybody but let the students read. Sometimes you might even say, when you post, create a forum, you can say, I want every student to respond to at least one other student in this space. And so that they know, and, and build that in as part of the grade, you know, that the students will get. If you don't set up these things, then your students will not know that they are, they, they, what to do. And so the burden falls on you, the burden of the work. All right. So do some of those as you, you go along. That's what I would want to suggest. Um, um, have clear directional signposts as you engage are, are some of the things that you can pay attention to. Giving timely feedback on forum posts. My biggest sin in online teaching is that I tend to not give feedback as quickly as I can. And real, realistically, online feedback is more demanding and more time consuming than flipping paper. It so, is. Yeah, so you have to make sure you don't burn out. And even now as I'm talking to you, I know that you're at risk of burning out and losing concentration span. So you have to factor all of those in when you teach. So give time the feedback, but also don't set work where you have to be spending long hours of time. Work with a two hour turn, two, two, a one week turnaround time on giving feedback or make it realistic so that you don't damage your eyes and so on. Schedule periodic chat sessions, periodic um, BB sessions, Zoom sessions. And finally, I would want to say humanize your course so that students can see you as a real person, you know, a real person. All right. Um, I think this is where I, I need to wrap so up. Much. Okay. How many times well, have I said that? Oh God. Yeah, but there was one last question. Can you clarify where students will submit their work online as well as are we allowed to grade online? You, you'd you said that, but remind us. Submit, students will submit in RVLE. You create the assignment spots in RVLE or the forum spots in RVLE. Those are the two obvious ways that students can submit assignments. With the forum, everybody will see students post. So if you want it to be private, don't do the forum. Use the assignment space. And the assignment space, 
you go in and you can grade right there, put the grades right there. You're not going to lose them. They're right there. And when you come to the end of the course, you can download the grade book and you will have all the grades for the students in your course. As yes, an and there is no printing of anything, um, nothing like that. Huh? Um, no, you don't have to. You can just, no, you don't have to print at all until you do the UA thing, the UA mark sheet. All right. Um, any other questions? Uh, this has been up and down. I'm saying this has been a phenomenal session, you know, phenomenal. I have been to so many, and this one has just laid it out so clearly for me. That's so clearly. Here. I'm happy I could have been. I could have been of some help to you. I wish I could do more, but you know, you can only accomplish so much in two hours. Hello. Um, yeah, I don't know if everyone can hear me. But did you cover the recording of the um, where the recordings of our sessions are, are, are to be posted? Yes, I did show you where the recordings are. Once you log in, once you create your Blackboard um space every time that you, you can set a pre-recording if you wish and i showed you to the right side of the screen but you also could um you can choose when you start your recording and when you end your recording so once you start it and you are finished your session you click stop recording and when every single student has logged out that's when the recording will become available to students. So as if one student remains in the Blackboard space, the recording won't calibrate and do its thing. So as a lecturer, ask them to step out and you be the last person to step out. And the minute you do that, um, students can now go back to that Blackboard meeting room, click on the tab to the top left, and they will see recordings, select that, and they will get the recording. Okay, and that, that will just stay there um, until, it's, um, until it's deleted for whatever Yes, reason. you will have to be the one to delete it. Okay. Yes, you right. definitely will be the one to delete it. All right. Okay. Is this session being recorded? Yes, Olivine says it is. Yes, yes it is. I am recording it, yes. Right. I may have no space left in my computer when it's done, but I'm recording it. Okay, that's good. That's good. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Not no? for Dr. Moore Olivine, but in just a little while. Lost you there, Ron. What? I was saying the question is not for you, Dr. Moore. She's more mm -hmm. for Olivine. So when mm -hmm. you're, she's finished with you, then I'll ask her. Okay, all right. Right. Um, I was asking one last question. Is it possible to load old grades into the assignment section? When, what do you mean by that? I'm As not... in, we completed several assignments before the break. Mm. So would you be able to load those? All right. So what will happen is that... <sighs> The students were already in Orvelli, Opal? Uh, not all of no, them. No, no. All right. So what you'll have to do, since the students were not in Orvelli, you would have to go in and create those assignment slots. So you would name them assignment one, two, three. Imagine you have five assignments for the course. And three assignments have already gone. And now that they're coming back, they only have two assignments left to, to complete. So you'd have to go in and create all five assignment slots. The students will, up, will, will submit these two assignments. That's fine. But the three before you would have graded, but the students don't need to submit them. There's, the students will be, once they're registered for the course, they will appear on the assignment um, in that assignment space. So what you can do now is go in and type in, just put in the grade that each student had received from you. And the reason why you're doing that is because when you now come to the end of the course and you download your grade book, you want to see right. all five right. sets of grades there. If exactly. you don't put in these three first assignments, then when you do your grade book, you're only going to see these two. So you have to go back, 
create three, the three early assignments, only just put in the grades for each student. You don't need to ask the students to upload anything. Their names will be there and so on. All right? Okay, thank you very much. That's if you want. Yes, thanks. Students' grades are only seen by the student himself. So my grades won't be seen by the Israeli Hutton. Or no, so. only if Israeli has access to your course. But if he's another student in the class with me, my he, grade profile, will be private profile. for me. No, you can, a separate log on. you can choose not to let students see gradebook. And you can let them see it if you want in our valley. So and, you if they see it, and if they see it, they'll be seeing the entire gradebook or they're just seeing their own grades? They'll be seeing their own. Their own. Okay, all right. Mm -hmm. All right. And um, once you mark an assignment and put the grades in the assignment slot, the students will see it. When they click on the grade book, they just see the composite grades for each of the assignments. So they're seeing their grades in two different places. On each specific assignment, when they click on it, and if they click on grade book, they'll see the composite set of assignments and the grades. But um, play around, it, it's there, it's there. We, we couldn't cover every tool tonight. I know you're anxious, but you'll be fine. Oh. And um, you'll be fine, and we can also talk, all right? Okay. All right, I'm, I'm, it's over to you guys. I see Dr. Um, Professor Houghton getting ready to say something. Well, I, clearly I was not, uh, my mic must have been muted. But um, let me again um, thank Dr. Moore for her significant input. Um, we were concerned that we were not totally up to speed. Um, some persons maybe may have been 50%, some 60, some 80. But even those who feel that they're 90%, I think you have taken us right up to the top in terms of being able to conduct uh, our classes with some confidence and assurance. Uh, also, let me take the opportunity to thank um, the colleagues, the lecturers from the program and others who may have come to participate in this um, session. We hope that um, at a later time, we could have a follow-up session um, we will have learned much and may have still ha have a few more questions to ask and, and to get um, answers from um, Dr. Moore. So let me thank you again very much, Dr. Moore and colleagues for participating in this session for the HRD uh, program. Thank you again. All right, so yes, um, I've said my thanks. I'm um, really, really indebted to you, Dr. Moore, really, really indebted. Um, a bazillion thanks to everybody who came here because the thing is, the fact that we're all here, I cannot, I mean, I might not remember everything, but I can always call Opal Bernard or call Alicia Darby and ask, do you remember when she said that? No, she didn't say that. She said, you know, so we'll have, we'll be able to share knowledge and we'll have this video. I, I'm going to send it to the people who were here. I'm going to send the recording to the people who are here, but I will have it. So if there are other people around who need it, they can ask me. I'm not going to post it on YouTube. Do you think I should? We have an HRD, we have an HRD channel, but no, I won't. I will, I'll just keep it as a private resource for the department. All right. So you can you also so send it to me as well, Olivine. Thanks. Yes. Thanks. I'm going to send it to everybody who was here. It was an excellent, it was a phenomenal session. Thank you. I really, I learned a lot and I feel far more confident when people call me, I should be able to say, no man, check that. So I'm really looking forward to that. Sure. And I'm, I'm just gonna ask each of you to jump out of the Blackboard Collaborate room. Okay, yes, yes. Jump out now. We have Claudette there, Myrtle, Alicia, Rowan, and Yui, HRD. That's me. All right. All right, let me, I'm gonna jump out when you jump out. Remind me how to jump out, please. Just close the browser and you're good to go. Okay. All right, I was out. Uh...
I believe I'm out now. Yeah, so I just see Claudette and HRMD in it. Oh, nice. Claudette alone. Now we're good. All right, guys. Thank you. Okay, yeah. thank you too. All right. Thanks, thanks, everybody. All right. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Applause, applause, applause. Mm -hmm. Holiday. <laughs> yes. Uh -huh. Rohan? Right. So I'd send to ask, I saw something at the uh, session for multiple choice for about two hours. And I'd send to ask, is there a recording of that session one? And uh, I, I know at some point we'd started some development of online, online course materials. And you'd send to ask people for the content up to the point that they were. Did you do any further work on that? And I'm asking you because I would, I had just a little bit more to do. I'm interested in, in completing mine. Okay, I'm glad to hear that. Um, I did some, I didn't do your course, but I did for some other courses. And the thing about the, the multiple choice, yes, there we were promised, but I haven't seen a link for that yet, but we were promised that we would get that. That was last week, Thursday, I believe. So yeah, yes, we were so. told we would. So I'll get it as soon as I get it. I'm gonna ask for it because I know Charmaine McKenzie, the person who gave the talk, I will ask her if we can have it and um, I'll ask Keisha from the Dean's office if we can have it and then I'll get it out to you guys as soon as possible. The third and final question, Alvin, and I know from our, the meeting that we had, the question about persons who teach only for a semester was raised. But I remember there's once I, so I wanted to access RVLE, but because I was not registered for, well, not registered, I wasn't in on that particular semester. I couldn't. Mm -hmm. All right, what I did. Where a person may want to refresh or remind themselves yes. going into a semester, what to do. All right, what I did for the HRD program is that I made a lot of our lecturers, not every single one, but most of them, I put them down for teaching practicum because um, I asked the students what they would be interested in. And some people were interested in some non-traditional areas. So it allowed me to open up the list of persons for practicum. And I put them in as teaching practicum in this semester. So you are one of them. Several persons who are not normally teaching in this semester would have come in under the practicum umbrella. But so all of so once we're into this, once we're in the in, 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 in summer, we should be able to access our VLE. Well, practicum was listed as a semester two course. So, you know, it just worked. Well, up, up, to, up to today, there's still no access because I tried even this evening just before getting on and there's still no access. All right, the, the MITS contacted me. I spoke with them today. They asked everybody, I sent a link that they asked everybody to press and try to get on. Did you try that link or you tried um, another way? And that was a link coming directly from MITS? Yes, it was a link coming directly from MITS. This evening, just before the start of this um, session, I yes. sent it out. And you're still not getting on. Then it might mean that your password is obsolete. So mm -hmm. you would need to get a changed password. I was actually going to ask um, Kurt Wilson to just change everybody's password. You know, so I that think we that's a no, good no, idea. No, no. no I, I just got mine changed. So. Okay, all right. Well, I'll just, I'll give you, I'll give you Kirk Wilson's email. I'll publish that and you can speak with him directly because if he's going to change your password, he might ask you some personal questions. So I'm going to give you all his thing and you approach him about changing your password. Once you change your password, it will reactivate your account and then you can go on. But, but they um, had they had just changed mine um maybe about three weeks ago, you know, Olivine, when I first tried to get on. So mm. I don't know whether because there was no contract, it's gone obsolete again. But I don't know. Um I just called the support area and they they told me how to just go in and change the password. Okay. 
All right, well, try call Kirk Wilson. He's okay. the person who I have been dealing with to get on to RVLE. So he should be able to help us. I'm seeing here so that he's telling us. me that, sorry, the video, audio, and PowerPoint files from Shamin McKenzie's presentation were already shared. Uh, Keisha, can you tell I us something know. about I that? I haven't it? seen it. Huh? I didn't see it and I've been checking my I've been checking my UE email address and all of that. I haven't seen it. So if Keisha can give me a link, Keisha will follow up for us. She's just said that. Olivine, just backing up. You said earlier you sent an email. Yes. Um, just before the start of this session, it was to tell you that you should click on that link to go to RVLE. I'm not seeing it. I saw the last thing I saw from it was 4:30. Reminding us about the, the session. Okay. All right. I'll have to but send can, that. Can you send us Kirk Wilson's um, contact information, Olivine? Yes, please. yes, I'm going to. Uh -huh. All right, anything else? To, be able to have it for the weekend. Not from me. Okay. Yes, the last thing I saw was the Orville login. Um, yes, I see the message from, from, from you. From from it this evening about the or Orville login, but I guess we'll have to get the password change first. Does Mitz work on a weekend, Olivine? Not anymore, no. Um, no. because of this. Let me see. For the future, can I ask for ID numbers of staff members that you're requesting access for? I was unable to add the following persons. Please ask them to log in as soon as possible. All right, I I have been getting something. Course containers created. All right, Mr. Wilson and I have some other things to do here. He wrote to me an hour ago, but um, I will send, I was unable to add the following persons. So, so the thing is, your name, Dr. Martin Hall, is not one of the persons he said he wasn't able to add. So we'll see. Okay, so you say I need to I need to contact Mitz then to, or Mr. Wilson to to change. Yeah, Mr. The Wilson password. is from Mitz. Mr. Wilson is from Mitz. Okay. So it's just Kirk dot Wilson at uimona dot edu dot jm. Wait, wait, wait. Kirk dot Wilson mm -hmm. at uwimona dot edu dot jm. Wait, wait. Olivine, little slower. At uwimona. Uh huh. Dot edu. Mm hmm. Dot J M. Okay. K I R K Kirk Wilson. And it's the ampersand sign at the yes. at sign. Yes. Okay. At dot edu dot J M. Okay. Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. I'll I'll send him a thing and see whether he does respond over the weekend. Who knows? Okay. No, he's he's pretty good. He's pretty good about that. Yeah. All right. All right. Um, the question, the question that wasn't answered on the on the chat, and um, I guess this goes to the Israeli as well. Um, when they had the faculty board meeting, they were saying that the students were not to submit the assignments online, unless I heard incorrectly. But I heard something about the students were not to submit the um, the exams online um, and the assignments online and that there would be no grading online. No. So I I'm a little confused. I don't know if I heard incorrectly, but I'm a, a bit confused about that. But in this in this in this time when they're not on encouraging um, face not, to face not content, hearing. I'm just saying in this time where they're they're not well we shouldn't be having so much face to face contact. I'm I'm sorry, I didn't hear if, if there was a response. Yes, Rohan was saying that in this time with face to face, with no face to face contact Unlimited. being encouraged. The thing is that they did say that the, the question about not marking online, it was people wanting to know in the same way that um, the, the system can mark um, MCQ test for you. Can it do essays? No, it can't. That was what the whole issue was. People wanted to know if their essays would have been automatically marked by this, the software. And no, it will help you with your, with your coursework, but you have to mark 
the essays for yourself. That was what that was about. It wasn't that there yeah, but there, you there is a there is a marking tool, you know. So I guess that's why people there is actually um tools that you can actually write in on the essays and stuff and i guess maybe that's what people were asking about with that but i also heard the question about whether the assignments can be submitted online yeah, and yes, they expect their assignments to be submitted online they expect that because the thing is that um students but there was not... some talk about the space olivine there was some talk about the space yeah let me suggest though based on the discussions i've been following there are many tools available to us. The simple tool, a student email an assignment to you, you mark the assignment, make your comments, and you can return the, the script. And, and so that is, that is the basic way. But normally you wouldn't return the script to the student, is really. So I'm just trying to see what is really going to pertain because normally you don't return the script to the to the student. Mm -hmm. And also there was talk about the space that's available in terms of them submitting um, assignments online. But, but at least you can share the, the, the grades and the score with the student. Before it comes to the office for approval, Israeli? No. no, remember, you know, the students are submitting a number of pieces of assignment. Many times, for during the normal time, you would have provided the grade up to the point of exam. The point they're making, there may be four pieces of assignment. Well, this is what I do, and and this is within the within the rules of the university. The, the student must know where they are in terms of your assessment of their performance up to the point of the exam. So if the exam is a take-home exam, at least they should be know where they are in terms of their performance in the what we normally call the coursework part of the assessment. Yeah, well, I can understand that for the coursework. Yeah. So, but for the exams, what 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 is going to pertain there? Well, the exam the, the same. At the same procedures you we well for most of i think we we have all of you can confirm that that we you you generally have a second marking but bear in mind the main point being made by the university is that we don't have this time generated exam and so that's yeah. why the proposal was for take home but there was all there was also the, the comment that they didn't want emails because the university needs to preserve a thread. So they didn't want the work being emailed to the lecturers. I distinctly heard that comment. So I'm just saying, could could somewhere in the coming week clarify so that we just know what is the final position? Because those were the comments that I heard during that during that meeting so all right the faculty the faculty office has sent out a document that I'm going to share with you um, so I'm going to share it's the FAQs for the graduate programs so I'm going to sh send that out shortly uh, that, so that we can be all on the same page exactly yes so this is coming from the dean's office so I'm going to send that out but, but the, I think the main point is that we should not have any time on the exam that we set up any exam and they need to complete the exam within three hours. No, I know it's open book. I understand that this really, I know that it's going to be open book. You know, so I know that it's not going to be time bound. I'm more concerned about the submission of the final, the final work when it's done, what is, what is now the final decision in terms of where they're to submit to and um, in what format. Well, we, we can find out if there are further detailing of that. But okay. I'm sure that um, we use the same format that we use generally. Um, of course, we have to be aware of plagiarism as a, as a problem. Mm -hmm. And we use the same format. We, we, we know when I, when I know when a student is, has plagiarized. Right, so we're not going to. Um, so there, there are many weaknesses with what is happening. I think the university 
recognizes that and wants us to make sure we try our best to have the thing at a particular standard. Okay. Acceptable standard, in fact. Yeah, well, they, they spoke about the use of the Turnitin that I don't know whether they're telling the students to use Turnitin first before they send in the work or what. It's a lot of stuff, so we just need some clarifications. Okay. But Olivia, that document from the from the faculty faculty office should uh, provide some guidance. Okay. There's much flexibility, you know, if you if you think about it and listen carefully in terms of what to do. I've just sent the document, so you should see it coming through any minute now. Okay. Okay. So Olivia, so maybe we can have a uh, well, depending on the, on the cost to us, some follow-up session in the next four weeks, if, if, it's, ne if it's necessary. No, I know that. I know that. We seem to solve the problem. Yeah, I know that. We really fail to do that, you know that, boy. That's the end of us. Yes, no, I know that. I know that. But I'm sorry for the poor students, really. And I'm sorry for the staff, too. I mean, well, I'm, I'm going to leave the session. Yeah. Okay, Rowan. Thank you. Thank you. My I have to go and treat with my aunt, too. Yes, so yes, yes, well. yes. Mm. Yes, I know, Olivine. And Olivine, thanks a, a million again. You know, um, I know you don't, you don't have any office hours these days, you seem to work 24 hours a day. So thank you. Yeah, man, no problem at all. All right, so I'm going to leave the meeting. Okay. okay. All okay. right, thanks much. I'm heading out too. Bye, everybody. All right. Okay, Bye. well, good. Thanks yeah. for coming. Bye. 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 Night.